and then pause it. Great, are you ready to go, Rana? Yes, you want me to share my screen? Uh, I'll give you an uh, introduction first and then you okay. can. Great, okay, well, thank you everyone today for joining us um, for this colloquium brought to us by uh, Professor Rana Ezzedine from the University of Florida. Rana did her PhD at the University of Montpellier in France uh, with Bertrand Plez. And then in 2015, she started at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as well as the Joint Institute of Nuclear Astrophysics as a postdoctoral fellow um, working with Anna Frabel. And that is where I had the personal good fortune to meet Rana. Um, and since the start of this year, since the start of 2020, she's been an assistant professor um, at the University of Florida. Um, so Rana's research is really wide ranging. It spans everything from theoretical to observational work. Um, so her PhD work was, and a lot of her work since then, focused on um, modeling of non-local thermodynamic equilibrium inside of stellar atmospheres. And this is really a critical thing um, to interpret the abundances of metal core stars. So she's been involved with constructing model atoms and using the most recent um, developments inside of atomic physics. Um, Rana has then applied these uh, methods through high resolution spectroscopy um, of the most metal core stars. She's done this uh, with spectroscopy of stars on the ground at uh, Magellan, uh, as well as um, UV spectroscopy with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and more recently, um, she's a core member of the R Process Alliance and has been searching to understand um, metal core stars in the Milky Way from that, set, from that side. Um, so before I hand it over to Rana, I wanna ask everyone to remember to mute your mics, which you have all done very nicely. Um, and as far as questions, we'll hold sort of big questions until the end of the talk. Um, but if you have a clarification question in the middle, you can raise your hand or type it in the chat. Um, and if you have questions that you want um, held until the end, but you're afraid you'll forget them, you can also feel free to put them in the chat as well. Um, so with that, uh, Rana, please take it away. Thank you so much, Alex, for this nice introduction. And thanks, everyone. So I'll start by uh, sharing my screen. Can you see my screen OK? OK. Um, so thanks so much again for this invitation. I'm very, very happy uh, to be giving a talk for a lot of uh, experts on spectroscopy at, at Carnegie uh, and talk about my research. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators uh, here that I listed some of my collaborators. Of course, this work would not be possible without them. So my talk is entitled Insights into the Lives and Death of the First Stars with Stellar Archaeology. And I'd like to start by giving those in the audience who are not very familiar uh, with uh, stellar archaeology or who have not talked to Alex before uh, of what it is. Um, and so you're probably familiar with the term archaeology itself, and that is here on Earth, uh, searching for the oldest objects or the oldest fossils on Earth in order to understand its history. And so stellar archaeology is basically the same thing, but instead we are looking for the oldest stars in the Milky Way in order to understand its history. And so in the next few slides, I'm going to be telling you why exactly those older stars can give us an insight into the early universe or the early galaxy formation, and where do we really find those older stars. So this is a talk about origins, obviously, so we have to go all the way to the beginning and all the way to the Big Bang. So it all started with the Big Bang. And the reason why we go all the way there, because our story involves us understanding the formation of the different chemical elements. And so um, at the Big Bang, or a few seconds after the Big Bang, the universe was mainly made of hydrogen and helium with little bits of, uh, of lithium, beryllium, and boron. And the very first stars in the universe were made from this gas, uh, which, uh, which meant that uh, they didn't have any, any heavy elements inside, inside of them. And we will talk a little bit more about them later. And at the end of their lives, these very first stars uh, exploded into the first supernova explosions. And what we know so far about these first stars, or as we call them, population three stars, is that they were massive. And so they must have been short-lived. They didn't live for a very long time. Throughout these first supernova explosions, the very first stars must have ejected their elements from which they were made and whatever extra elements were forged at the core of this, their, these first stars, including carbon, iron, etc., into the interstellar medium from which the second best thing, the second generation stars or the population two stars were formed. 
Now, what we know about these population two stars is that they were lower mass because the, the gas has had time more to cool and fragment into different pieces due to the presence of extra metals. And so because they were low mass stars, we believe that these population two stars are still around until the present day. And so this is basically the promise or the premise, pardon me, of, of this talk and our work in stellar archaeology is that we try to find the slowest population, lowest mass population two stars and study them in order to understand um, or infer information about what came before them. Now, the observable universe really starts after those slow mass stars, at least with the technology that we have today. And so the information that we get about, uh, about the era before these population two stars, so the first stars, the supernova explosions, comes mainly from uh, cosmological simulations. Uh, and, these, and this is an example of uh, a set of cosmological simulations that started at MIT, which Alex is involved in, and by a paper written by Griffin et al., which tried to um, simulate the first stars in a Milky Way first galaxy. And as you can see that uh, these cosmological simulations tell us that the first stars uh, likely formed, or probably formed in uh, dark matter mini halos um, because as I said the gas uh, was hadn't time to cool or there wasn't enough metals in it to cool they must have been very massive so about 10 to 100 times uh, the solar mass and thus they were short-lived as we said and they ended their lives with supernova explosions. Um, now, with stellar archaeology, uh, we will have the opportunity to revisit the properties of these first stars by doing an inverse program, uh, a problem, uh, as is shown in this nice illustration here, also uh, written by Alex or prepared by Alex, where basically when we find or when we, when we, when we study these low mass stars that uh, the old low mass stars found in our galaxy today, we use stellar archaeology in order to probe into the star forming gas cloud from which they were formed, assuming that these pristine gas clouds have been enriched at least with one or a few events of uh, supernova explosions of first stars or first generation of stars. And so by doing a high resolution or by following up uh, spectroscopically through high resolution um, of these low mass stars, we can use their chemical abundances in order to infer information about the first stars. And I will show you a few examples how we've done that through our studies and how what the interesting results that we got were. And so before that, um, where do we find these oldest stars? Now, obviously, it's, it's not a very easy, easy uh, task to do. Uh, but what we know so far from different models of the formation of our Milky Way is that the oldest stars or population two stars are found mainly in the Milky Way halo. Of course, they are found in the bulge and other places, but the Milky Way halo is the easiest place to find them. Um, and we have a problem, however, is that, that many of them are far and faint. And so we cannot go ahead and collect high resolution spectra of all the halo stars. We need to limit it down to those that are most interesting and exciting. And so the way we do this is we go first through a, a medium resolution uh, step before we go to the high resolution follow up of these stars, uh, particularly with those uh, medium resolution surveys that look at the calcium H and K lines. And the reason we look at these lines is because they are strong and so they are even found in the oldest stars. And using specific calibrations by different studies, example here that of Jacobson et al in 2015, they show that um, uh, the, the, the calibration, if we, we are able to calibrate the abundance of the calcium H and K line to a first guess of the iron content uh, of these stars. And if the star is particularly interesting, for example, the, the lower the iron over hydrogen ratio, the more interesting the star is because it means it's more metal poor and thus it is older. And so um, the fundamental tools of our research, as I said, is going after that we've determined interesting stars from medium resolution from different surveys. We then go to the uh, high resolution spectroscopy with the biggest telescopes in the world that we can find, uh, if we can get time on them, of course. Um, and we collect optical uh, a spectra of these stars, but we also sometimes need to go to the UV because some of the lines that we need to uh, correctly par parameterize the properties of these stars and their progenitors, we need some elements that we can't find in the optical, but we also need to go to the UV.
And once we get the spectra of these stars, we combine them with uh, atomic data, with stellar atmospheres, with radiative transfer codes in order to infer their abundances. So this is basically the premise of stellar archaeology uh, and what we do. Uh, but for those also who are not very familiar with old stars, or as we call them, metal poor stars, I thought I'll give you a little bit of a refresher and some nomenclature. And so not all metal poor stars are, are born equal, meaning that uh, there has been a few review papers here, like Beers and Kreisleib in 2005 and Frebel in 2018, where they divided uh, our knowledge of the metal poor stars um, or metal poor stars into uh, different, um, different categories based on their iron metal content. Uh, which is a proxy to the total metallicity of the star. And so the typical metal poor star that we know has a metallicity of below minus one, but then it can get to very metal poor star as the metallicity goes down, extremely metal poor, all the way to ridiculously metal poor stars at minus 10. However, uh, of course, we have not yet detected any um, ridiculously metal poor star. We have, though, uh, detected a few stars that are mega metal poor at metallicities below minus six, uh, where the universe just gave us a few beautiful gifts um, to add to our, to our sample of stars. And we have most of the time detected either few iron lines or barely any lines, as you can see the spectrum of an example of a star at minus 5.4, or sometimes just up upper limits of, of metallicities that we knew would have been uh, less than minus six. Now, the interest of dividing uh, metal poor stars into these subcategories uh, is interesting to us because um, we there's no single way for us to know how many progenitors did each of these uh, population two metal poor stars have. However, we do know uh, from some uh, studies and some cosmological simulations is that as we go toward more metal poor stars, so the less metal the star had, it is likely to be mono enriched, which means that it's likely had a single progenitor rather than multiple progenitors. And ideally, we'd want to find those that are mono enriched because then it's easier, easier for us to do stellar archaeology to pinpoint the properties of its single first star progenitor. And so for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about some of the research that I've been doing using stellar archaeology. Um, and I'm going to focus on stellar abundances and how we get precision, particularly stellar abundances, to do this kind of work. I'm going to be talk about the first stars um, and how, what kind of properties we can derive using stellar archaeology, especially focusing on some recent results that we got, and also a little bit about nuclear astrophysics, including the R process. And all of our tools for doing all of this is metal poor stars, which is quite interesting. And so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about first stars and their first supernova explosion properties particularly. So some of the open questions that I'm interested to answer in my research is the properties of the first stars, including their masses, uh, their supernova explosion energies, and the mechanisms of these explosions. Now, obviously, it's very important because um, the types of explosions that happened at the earlier times in the first stars um, help us identify the level of reionization that, that took place uh, because, of, because of these explosions. And so theoretically, some of the possibilities that have been suggested uh, of these supernova explosions is that the first stars would explode with typical core collapse spherical supernova explosions, which are usually considered faint, ranging between 0.3 and uh, 1 beta. Uh, some others uh, suggested that uh, the first stars could also explode with magnetar jet-like supernova explosions, more energetic, or if the masses of the first stars are large enough, they could explain or they could explode with parent stability supernova explosions. Now, you can, you can say that we can go to the masses or the predicted masses of the first stars to infer what type of explosions could have happened or they could have undertaken. However, unfortunately, from a cosmological point of view, so here what I'm showing you is the mass range as a function of year publication of all different cosmological simulations that have predicted masses of the first stars. As you can see, theoretically, this is far from being constrained. The masses that have been predicted for the first stars range all the way from one solar mass all the way to a thousand solar masses from different simulations. And so we need a better constraint or if we can do or we can place better constraints on these masses, it will be much more helpful. Uh, 
And this is what we do with stellar archaeology. And so here is an example of a study done by Vini Placo et al. in 2015, where he took the 21 uh, most metal-poor stars at the time. So at the time, there was only 21 stars that had a metallicity be dominant spore. Today, we know about 30 of those. So in the past decade, we've only been, been able to identify about 30 of those stars, which is quite difficult. And so what he did is he uh, measured the, uh, or determined the abundance pattern of uh, these stars. And here I show two examples, HE0107 and HE1327. So these are two uh, hyper metal poor stars with metallicities below minus five. And then uh, he compared the abundance patterns of these stars to the yields of a first star supernova explosion, uh, including Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And obviously this yields should highly depend on the mass and on the energy of the first star supernova. So here we're assuming that these stars must have had only a single progenitor first star um, ahead of time. And so what, what uh, they found in this study, um, they used this on all the 21 stars and thus they were able to build some kind of um, IMF uh, for the first stars using this sample. What they found here uh, in terms of mass is that the masses of the first stars must have ranged all the way from about one to 30 solar masses. So somehow constrained and the energies um, mostly range uh, between 0 0.4 and 0 0.7 um, uh, beta or times 10 to the power of 51 ergs. And so most of these energies were found to be faint. Um, now this brings us to uh, an interesting star that we, uh, we uh, undertook um, a year ago, which was uh, one of the stars that I mentioned before. It's called HE15, uh, 13, pardon me, 1327, uh, 2326. I'm sorry, I'm missing a two here. But uh, this star is very interesting because it is one of the earliest hypermetal poor stars detected. So it was one of the first stars with a metallicity below minus 5.2 or below minus 5 that was detected by Anna Frebel in 2005. Now, the, why this star is interesting is because it has been very well studied in the optical region lots of time on really big telescopes. But more the reason why it's interesting is because it's the only ultra metal poor star or hyper metal poor stars that is bright enough for UV observations. And so what I'm showing you here is again the abundance pattern relative to iron of this star as a function of atomic number. And you can see that many elements have been nicely determined and however there are as we go toward the higher atomic number uh, the upper limit we only have upper limits of few of these elements. So what has been done before, before our study, was uh, the best fit of a supernova explosion of a first star progenitor was found to be a, a spherical supernova explosion with an energy of 0.3 times 10 power 51 ergs, which nicely matched many of the lighter elements, including carbon oxygen. As you can see, and you probably heard about this before, these stars have a lot of carbon and oxygen in them. And this has to do something with the type of supernova explosions, but also it has to do with the formation of these stars, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. They also have somehow enhancement or lighter enhancements in terms of the alpha elements. However, the iron peak elements here uh, are slightly enhanced, not as much as the alpha and carbon. But what you can see is that the spherical supernova explosion that was previously fit to the star could not fit the iron peak elements very well. However, additionally, we were also don't have many measurements of these elements in this region, particularly zinc. Now, zinc is a very interesting element because it is an explosive element. It is formed at the time of the supernova explosion itself. And so if we can detect a zinc uh, measurement in this star, then that would really help us to constrain the supernova explosion itself in terms of energy, but also probably in terms of geometry. And this is what we did. We went uh, ahead and obtained a UV HST cost spectrum of the star. Remember, it's the only hypermetal poor star bright enough that allows us to do that. And indeed, we were able to determine a zinc detection at 2138 angstrom of this star. But what was very exciting is not only that we detected the first zinc abundance or first zinc element in a hypermetal poor star or an ultrametal poor star, but that the zinc relative to iron ratio was highly enhanced. And this was very interesting. 
The reason why it's interesting is because over the past uh, decade or even longer than that, people have been trying to answer the question as to why does the zinc ratio relative to iron increase as we go toward lower metallicities? What could be the production site or what is producing such high values of zinc? And as you can see, it keeps increasing as we go toward lower metallicities. Multiple, um, multiple uh, theories have been suggested. One of them was that uh, zinc, since it's an explosive element, it should be formed during a specific type of explosion, particularly that of a jet-like supernova explosion. So a hypernova, which will have energy much larger than what has been predicted before, and would have jet-like features that would allow to extract the zinc from falling onto the nascent black hole outward from which a star like ours would probably be formed. And indeed, we were able to fit the full abundance pattern of our star better with a jet-like supernova explosion yield. Obviously, we did a lot of tests. We did a lot of MCMC modeling to try to see if we were missing something. What if we didn't account for all different energies or all different masses? But all of them pointed that spherical supernova explosions will not be able to enhance zinc and other elements, iron peak elements, to such high values. And therefore, it is very likely that the explosion responsible of a first star that was responsible for the abundance pattern of our star, and maybe others if we can detect more zinc, would be a jet-like supernova explosion with a higher energy or a hypernova uh, than was expected before. And as I mentioned, um, the, uh, as, and as shown here in this, in this kind of cartoon, is that uh, of a jet-like supernova, and you can see that the iron and the zinc would be ejected along these jets, which would allow extraction of, uh, of these elements from the core of the star rather than falling onto the nascent black hole outward into the gas cloud from which our star could have formed, which is very interesting. Now, what we were thinking about and what we were interested in is the implication of such type of aspherical jet-like explosions taking place in the early universe. Uh, not only were they able to explain the zinc abundance of our star and probably other stars as well, but what did that tell us about the origin scenarios and the different chemical enrichment that could happen in the early universe? Um, as I mentioned before, the type of stars that we observe, especially POP2 stars, population 2 stars, have a lot of carbon in them, and we call them, many of them are carbon enhanced, whereas some of them are found to be carbon normal. So we have this two population of stars. One of them have a lot of carbon, one of them are not. And people have been trying to answer the question is where do these different types of stars come? And so some people uh, suggested maybe there's different mixing or inhomogeneous mixing happening in the gas cloud. But also what if there could be multiple enrichment channels taking place, some of them which could be uh, due to jet-like supernova explosions happening, whereas some of them could be due to different types of explosions. And indeed, this has been um, uh, actually vis revisited multiple times in the past few years, but particularly uh, in the past few weeks, actually, uh, there has been few studies, including that by William Hicks from UC San Diego and Gen Chiaki from, um, from Georgia Tech, who try to revisit the enrichment scenarios using cosmological simulations and using jet-like supernova to try to understand whether that can explain the abundance patterns we observe in the population two stars. So I highly recommend, and if you're interested in this, please visit these, these papers to check. And one of the interesting th um, simulations was done here by Gen Shiaki, where they show the effect of the uh, of these ex uh, external enrichment scenario, where an explosion, uh, so a first star, uh, pardon me, a first star would explode um, uh, by supernova explosion in one mini halo, and then it will enrich a neighboring mini halo, and they show the effect of uh, enrichment of, for example, iron and carbon into this neighboring mini halo. Um, and this is basically density weighted. And they show that indeed, it is highly probable that uh, external enrichment was very probable in the early universe and which explains uh, why or could explain maybe this multiple um, 
carbon in enhancement that we see in these population two stars. So I think that's very interesting and it gives us a really nice insight into how did the population two stars form and how did the first stars die and in what means. Obviously, uh, the higher the energy, the more enrichment there would be and more external enrichment. But I think this should, uh, this should and will be studied furthermore in, in future. So that's very exciting. Um, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit. Yeah. Um, so can you try and hide the toolbar at the top of your Zoom screen? If you click oh, the yeah. button. Sure. Oh, yeah. Is it side. better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, sure. Of course. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk a little bit about um, also early stars or very old stars, maybe not as old as first stars, uh, but close enough. And um, I'm going to talk about nuclear astrophysics, particularly updates from the recent uh, work by the R Process Alliance. Um, so I'm sure all of you have been hearing a lot about the R Process in the news lately, uh, but I'm going to be just reminding some of you or some of the audience who are not familiar with this uh, of what the R Process is. Uh, so the rapid neutron capture process from its name uh, requires a rapid flux of neutrons onto a seed uh, element uh, to form the heavier elements that lie in the lower part of the, of the Milky Way. And we know that we have another uh, method called the S process, which also forms half of the or many of the elements in the Milky Way, except for thorium and uranium, which are only formed using um, uh, from, the, from the R process. Um, and it's interesting, uh, I wanted to include this, this very new uh, periodic table. There has been a lot of modifications to the periodic table lately and where the elements came from. And this was by a study from uh, uh, Kobayashi, who showed very nicely the chemical evolution of elements and the contribution from the different events that could, could form these elements as a function of time. Um, and we all know that, or you have heard probably, that um, the R process uh, is most likely, uh, uh, the site of the R process is coming from the neutron, neutron star merger uh, because there's uh, enough flux to actually uh, form these elements. And I will show here um, why we thought of this even before the first neutron star merger was observed in 2017 is a, a simulation uh, along a chart of nuclei. So what you're seeing here is uh, N axis, so neutron axis and Z axis. And when and this is the time after the merger itself. And what you're seeing here is these uh, blast of formation of heavier and heavier elements um, that beta decay onto what we call uh, the value of stability if the element that is formed is stable and the abundances there as you see um, they, um, the density of the abundances uh, particularly uh, show around some peaks that we call the first, second, and third peaks, particularly the second, the third peak of the, of the R process. And I will talk about this a bit uh, later. And so, uh, yes, in 2017, it was such a, the, the universe gave us such a beautiful bounty where LIGO and Virgo observed the first uh, binary neutron star merger and its electromagnetic counterpart, which was very exciting. What we were particularly interested in uh, as, as, our, as people who love the R process and the heavy elements is particularly the electromagnetic counterpart uh, where obviously a, a kilonova uh, was um, a light curve was, was obtained from all of the telescopes around the world, which had two components, a blue component, which was short in time and a red component that lasted longer. And this kilonova we now know, or we know that is powered by the radioactive decay of a few solar masses of our process elements being formed, uh, which was very interesting because for a very long time, people were trying to pinpoint the site of the R process and we were able to do it um, with observations. Uh, now, this is very interesting to observe the counterpart itself. However, in the, in the uh, ejecta of the kilonova, we are unlikely able to actually measure or detect the R process itself because the, the ejecta will be too blurry. And therefore, we need to find another way to, to find and measure these R process lanthanides and elements. And we can do this in stars, particularly in metal poor stars. Uh, because it is likely that the R process has been happening for a long time 
And uh, therefore, the oldest stars would be the most pristine objects, which, has not, which have not been enriched by multiple uh, events like this. So we can uh, uniquely uh, identify the R process and then pin it back to the, to the event itself and the properties of the neutron star merger itself. And so to give you a little bit of insight into this, um, this is uh, what you're seeing here is the log of the abundances as a function of atomic number of one of the first R process enhanced stars that was um, observed and, and uh, um, discovered by Chris Needham, 2008, and it was highly studied. Uh, it's CS22892052. And the abundances, the measured abundances or determined abundances of the star are shown in the red points here. What you're seeing in the blue line is the fit, no, pardon me, it's not the fit actually, it's the solar, scaled solar R process abundances. So we just scale it relative to the metallicity of this star. And as you can see that it shows as if we are fitting the data, where in fact we are not fitting the data. This is just such a beautiful match. And the reason this is a beautiful match is because whatever produced the R process in the old star in the CS22892 must have also produced it in the, uh, the sun and in other uh, younger stars, which tells us that the R process must be a unique event. And so inspired by all of this and inspired by the event of uh, of the uh, gravitation wave in 2017, uh, we have started uh, what we call the R Process Alliance, uh, a collaboration, uh, and it's as cool as it sounds. It's a multi-stage, multi-year effort that we aim to provide observational, theoretical, and experimental constraints on the nature and the origin of the astrophysical R process. And we do that by basically trying to obtain uh, and collect um, as many R process enhanced metal poor stars as possible. And it's very interesting because I show you here an example of two metal poor stars, one that is R process enhanced in red and one that is just a metal poor, not R process enhanced. And you can see that in the spectra that we collect, if a star is R process enhanced, we're able to detect all these beautiful R process elements, including those that I'm sure elements that you probably never heard of in the periodic table, sumerium, cerium, lanthanum, dysprosium, all of these beautiful elements. And so we, try to find these elements. And to give you a perspective of what the R Process Alliance has been able to do in the past few years, so in the literature from 2003 up until 2015, um, a lot of studies have been able to find R Process enhanced stars, and we usually define them uh, by having a europium over iron abundance higher than one. So those that have a europium relative to iron higher than one means that they are highly enhanced. So we call them R2, whereas those that are between 0 0.3 and one, we call them intermediate enhanced. And there are probably differences in the different enrichment events that produce these, these different types of elements in these stars. But up until 2015, only about 10 or 12 of these highly enhanced R process stars were found because mainly there wasn't a concentrated effort to find these stars. Um, but since the R Process Alliance started, we have had multiple data releases in 2018. And as you can see, we have been able to more than double the previous numbers of the R Process uh, enhanced stars. And we're continuing to do that. So we're working on more, um, uh, more concentrated efforts. We currently have about 2000 spectra collected in all uh, of very highly um, or very likely candidates of R Process stars that we're going to be releasing uh, out there very soon. Um, but the second stage of our, of our interest in the, in the R process effort is not only to uh, find and collect spectra of the R process uh, enhanced stars, but also use them uh, to try to understand and draw back onto the properties of the neutron star merger itself and what we can learn about these enrichment events. And so if we peek onto uh, the detailed R process abundance pattern of these stars shown here in an example for about 20 different highly enhanced R process stars. Very interesting patterns emerge where, again, they match very nicely the solar, the scaled solar R process pattern for most of the second peak and the third peak. However, in the first peak, we see that we have a lot of dispersion.
And one idea is what if this dispersion in the first peak elements of the R process could pro probably come from the blue component or the red component of the kilonova itself. And we aim to try to use this detailed abundances of many R process stars as possible to relate this to the neutron star properties for including the mass ratios, the energies, etc. And this is what I'm working on with uh, currently um, a student here at UF, Shivani Shah. Uh, we have been able to uh, get a UV spectrum uh, of a very highly enhanced R process star. And what the UV spectrum adds to the optical spectrum that we have already collected for the star is that it adds much more elements, as you can see here in blue, that we're not able to detect in the optical. So this gives us a much more beautiful pattern and much more constrained R process abundance pattern that we can use to compare to the, uh, to, for example, yields from different neutron star mergers. And so stay tuned for, for this kind of study um, uh, that uh, we are going to release um, soon. But also Ian Roder, uh, who many of you might know, is also very interested and in also working on a similar star where he was able to measure from um, in collaboration with the R Process Alliance uh, about 93 or 92 different elements um, in the star, in one star, one metal poor star at the same time, which is very, very exciting. So stay, stay tuned for that. Um, now, from another perspective, uh, the R process are very interesting because they can also provide us with environmental constraints um, on, uh, onto the formation of these metal pore stars. Uh, and we do that, or we are able to do that, uh, from uh, observations of uh, satellite dwarf galaxies around our Milky Way. If you have ever talked to Alex, I'm sure he told you about these beautiful systems that are really amazing tools to study star formation and chemical evolution. Particularly, Alex must have told you about his favorite galaxy. I think it's everyone's ultra uh, favorite galaxy, which is Reticulum 2. This nice galaxy uh, was discovered in 2015 by the Dark Energy Sur Survey. It's dark matter dominated just like other dwarf galaxies. It has old metal poor stellar population, but it's also the first highly enhanced R process um, dwarf galaxy that was discovered. And this gave us such a beautiful insights because we see these highly enhanced R process stars in reticulum too, but we also see them in the Milky Way halo. So this might give us some insights into the formation of the Milky Way halo from accretions of such systems. Of course, not, now Gaia has revolutionized our understanding of the formation of the Milky Way. And I know many of the people at Carnegie are working on such beautiful um, projects to try to constrain this formation by observing stellar streams and others. So it's very exciting. Uh, so what if we can use uh, the uh, we can, if we can detect more R process stars in such uh, systems, that would be very in interesting uh, because we will be able to place constraints onto, for example, the different yields coming from uh, neutron star mergers that, um, that caused the formation, or pardon me, that enriched the gas from which the stars are formed that were found in, in reticulum 2, as you can see here, where Alex in his paper showed that neutron star merger at the time would probably be the likely enrichment um, uh, enrichment site of the R process itself. Um, now, speaking of uh, dwarf galaxies and of Milky Way halo, it would be nice if we can also try to show some evidence of this accretion. And this is uh, what a study that uh, uh, my undergraduate students, Zoe Hackshaw and I uh, have, been, uh, have been doing, where again, the universe gave us a beautiful star. Uh, sometimes the cosmos does that, where we were able to uh, find discovery star as part of the R process alliance data release in ESAD in 2020. Uh, this star is called HE 0007-1752. What was interesting about it is that it's a Milky Way halo star, so it's a giant star like any of the others. However, what we found is that it had much lower abundances in many of the alpha elements and the iron peak elements as compared to the Milky Way halo. But what was more interesting about this is not only did it have low abundances in all of these elements, it was highly enhanced in our process. So it was an R2 star. And in fact, when we compare the europium over magnesium abundance of the star, we find that it 
beautifully matches that of, uh, of the abundances of the stars from Reticulum 2, which gives us an insight that this star must have likely accreted from such a system or a system similar to Reticulum 2. What's more interesting is that in this star, we were also able to measure an age uh, for this star uh, from uh, cosmo or nucleocosmochronometry using thorium of Euro uh, europium uh, ratio. And we determined an age of about 12.4 giga years, which was interesting because that means we can also, if the star indeed has accreted from such a system, such a old uh, uh, galaxy system, we can also use this to age the, the galaxy itself uh, of about 12.4 giga years. So this is work in progress, uh, but I just wanted to share some of this exciting results here. Uh, now, finally, I would like to uh, switch gears and uh, talk a little bit about uh, stellar abundances and um, why I'm doing this really big shift uh, in, in my talk is because you have heard me talk so far about why abundances are important. They, important were, they were important for the R process, they were important for our first star study. So obviously, the better we can constrain or determine precise and accurate abundances, um, the, more, the, the more precise the conclusions that we can, we can um, deduce. And so um, why do I talk about abundances? Uh, because uh, I'm sure that from different talks, you have always heard people say we measured abundances. However, I would like to always, I, I always like to mention this is that abundances are not measurable quantities. And maybe I said it too, I'm sorry if I did, because they are uh, modeled quantities. They are as good, they are only as good as their models. And behind every observation uh, that we do or behind every spectrum and determination of, of parameters or of abundances, there is a whole uh, big machinery going on in the background as is shown here by this nice Ben Gustafsson uh, cartoon uh, from Uppsala. So Ben Gustafsson, for those who don't know, he's one of the founding fathers of stellar atmospheres. Um, and in this machinery goes a lot of approximations that uh, people doing spectroscopy and spectroscopic analysis do, uh, including uh, suggesting or, um, uh, pardon me, appro uh, sorry, they, they assume that the star or the, the atmosphere of the star is plane parallel versus being a spherical model. Uh, they assume that the star is homogeneous, uh, it's stationary, it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, and many of these assumptions can be okay for a large number of stars. However, there are other models that can affect abundances more than the others, including assuming local thermodynamic equilibrium, and I will talk about what that means, or assuming that the star is in one dimension versus three dimensions. So what is local thermodynamic equilibrium or LTE? Now a little refresher to spectral Lyell formation. So those beautiful lines that we see in our spectra, uh, how do they form in stars? Uh, we have to include obviously a radiative transfer code and we have to assume some kind of population synthesis for the elements and for the electrons in this, in this star in order to determine abundance. And in LTE, um, it is likely as, or people assume that the matter is in equilibrium with the radiation field over a finite value, a volume of gas, which means that the properties of the gas can be defined by one temper temperature at each depth in the atmosphere. Now, this is okay, uh, as you can imagine, in uh, stars or environments which are heavily uh, matter dominated, which means that um, there's, you know, for example, the cores of the star or stars that are on the main sequence. Um, however, stars that have extended atmospheres, such as giants, supergiants, but also metal poor stars, which really don't have enough matter to induce this equilibrium, LTE is no longer valid. And therefore, we have to uh, perform a full non-local thermodynamic equilibrium analysis uh, where things get a little bit more complicated because the photons um, that we collect on our spectrographs uh, carry non-local information. And therefore, we have to include in our analysis all types of radiative interactions and collisional interactions that happen in the atmosphere of the star. And so to give you a little bit more insight into this, in LTE, when we want to do a spectroscopic analysis or determine the abundance of one line, one transition, we need the information, the atomic data of the upper and higher level of this line. In non-LTE, we have to 
include every single transition that can take place. So what you're seeing here is the atomic levels and their energies in an iron model atom, only a neutral iron model atom. And we have to take into account all about 80,000 transitions that can take place bec before we determine the abundance of the single line. That's computationally expensive, as you can imagine. However, it's necessary and important. And I'd like to show you what can happen if we ignore these effects in specific types of stars. So the way we quantify the uh, deviation from LTE in our models, we, uh, we, um, we introduce a, a term called departure coefficient, which is the ratio of the level population density in non-LTE divided by LTE. And I'm showing this departure coefficient plot here as a function of optical depth. So this is the core of the star, and this is going outwards into the outer layers of the atmosphere. As you can see, and I show here three different stars at different metallicities, the sun in red and two hypermetal poor stars below minus five. As you can see that as the star becomes more metal poor, the deviations from LTE increase and thus become even larger. But even for the sun, which is you know, a solar type star, it is the sun, it is solar itself. But um, what I mean is even it doesn't have low metallicity, it's also deviating in LTE from crucial parts where the line formation takes place usually between minus four and minus two. And so, um, in order for us to look furthermore onto these effects of non-LTE, we've done um, some kind of um, um, analysis or stellar parameter analysis where we've determined the, uh, uh, the stellar parameters, including the temperature, the gravity, the microturbulent velocity, and metallicities of, of uh, 20 standard metal poor halo stars. And we show here the effects of not including non-LTE in our analysis um, as a function of the parameter itself. And so delta T effective is the temperature of non-LTE minus LTE. And you can see that as a function of metallicity shown here in the color codes, as we go toward lower metallicities, the correction in temperature becomes larger up to 500 Kelvin. In gravity, it can get up to one dex. In metallicity, up to 0.45 dex. And in microturbulent velocity, which is a fudge factor that we use to account for velocities in the star, can also get to about 0.5 kilometer per second. Now, what matters is that these corrections due to ignoring non-LTE are larger than the typical uncertainties that we see in these stars. And so they can induce larger uh, uncertainties in our calculations. And one thing we wondered whether we keep decreasing the metallicity. So over here, our metallicity stopped at minus three, but what if we keep decreasing all the way to minus seven for our well-known uh, hyper and ultra metal poor stars? Does the correction in non-LTE keep increasing? We found out that yes, uh, as we go toward the lowest metallicity stars at minus seven for one of the mega metal poor stars detected, um, the correction in metallicity can reach up to one dex, which is quite large. But what was interesting is that the correction as a function of metallicity is found to be more or less linear. And we were able to derive a relation which allows you to calculate the deviation in metallicity in non-LTE um, as a function of your LTE metallicity. So this is a nice way to get a first estimate of your, of your corrections if needed. And it, it was found to apply very nicely to less metal poor stars even without uh, um, expecting them to fit. Which, which tells us that this, this linear relation is, is, can be used for a large uh, range of metallicities. Um, so it's obviously in important for us to include non-LTE effects. And I know that not everybody who's doing spectroscopic analysis or stellar population analysis wants to do that. It's, it's kind of expensive and computationally expensive. And this is why uh, my graduate student, Yang Yang Li at UF, uh, are developing an automized code. Uh, and we, we plan to include this into a web interface for the users, for the community uh, who are doing spectroscopic analysis uh, to determine their stellar parameters and abundances in non-LTE. And I show here some preliminary results of using an MCMC fitting uh, of um, the observations of uh, a benchmark metal poor star called HD 14283 in a pre-computed non-LTE grid, but in usually a grid is highly dispersed in terms of parameters. So what we did is we created a generalized curve of growth in order to, um, to account for all the different parameters in our grid 
and thus interpolate better um, in, in this grid. And we were able to find uh, that using our, our technique, our optimized uh, stellar parameters technique, we were able to determine the parameters of the star with really, really low uncertainties, which is very exciting. So this is work in preparation and we plan to make this public. We plan to make the grid public, but also the code public and the web interface for the community to use. So uh, also stay tuned for this. Finally, I'd like to say that non-LTE is not, I've, I've talked about iron so far because it's one of the most important elements in terms of metallicity, but it can happen at all metallicities and at all elements. And it has been shown here in the work done by Maria Bergeman or the review by Maria Bergeman in 2013, which shows the non-LTE effects for a bunch of different elements uh, for two types of solar benchmark stars, the Sun and Procyon, and two metal poor star, HD 14283 and HD 122563. As you can see, the non LTE um, effects are larger for metal poor stars for some elements. However, they can be also very large, like potassium, um, for some for some solar stars as well. So they are very important to take into account. And thus could be important for those who are interested in the um, host star exoplanet chemical relation. Uh, I know that, uh, and I've talked to some people where this, this uh, chemical correlation between the star and its exoplanet is very dependent on the accurate metallicities and the accurate abundances. So this is something to take into account and to look into. Finally, um, I'd like to say that uh, I've been leaving some of this non-LTE work and I've been continuing uh, to do that. So I have uh, already calculated a few non-LTE grids for some elements. I'm continuing to do for that for some strategically interesting elements. But if you have any elements that you're interested in and would like to see the non-LTE effects, please feel free to contact me uh, for that. And so finally, uh, I would like to um, summarize or say that uh, my work and my research work is uh, including or using uh, stellar abundances and stellar archaeology in order to infer the properties or the chemical enrichment events and the lives and the deaths of the very first stars or the oldest stars by using accurate models from first star nu uh, stellar uh, supernova yields or nuclear properties of our process and then mixing them with what we can infer, what we can understand about the sites and the environments of these chemical enrichment events. And so normally if we know any of these two, we can infer the third. And so I will leave here with my takeaway summary points. Uh, where I want to again mention how I love most metal poor stars in the, in the Milky Way and in the dwarf galaxies. They are indeed archaeological fossils of the early universe. We can use them to answer standing questions on the first stars, their supernova explosions, the formation of the heavy elements. We can also use them to constrain models of stellar physics of non-LTE and 3D because they have such extreme atmospheres and we can constrain the models themselves with that. So we need to keep digging for more metal poor stars with high resolution optical and UV spectro uh, spectrographs and big telescopes. And with that, I thank you very much and take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Rana. I will clap, and if anyone else wants to unmute briefly to clap, they can do so as well. Thank you. Um, and yeah, we'll take any questions. Um, so what we'll do by default is um, do the raise hand feature inside of Zoom, and um, if you raise your hand there, I will call on you, or you can also type it into the chat if you would like. Um, and why don't we start with Johanna? Great talk, thanks. Um, so. You were making this point right at the end where you showed a plot of the different uh, NLTE effects for a solar type star and the magnitude of those effects. Um, and you said like potassium is the highest. What, what's the typical magnitude of those effects in a sun-like star in terms of like dex? Uh, so I think what this plot showed particularly was about 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 dex and potassium is, is quite interesting and it all depends on the atomic structure obviously. So potassium has this atomic structure and particularly the first ionization energy is what plays the role. So depending on the where the lines form in the atmosphere, but also on the atomic structure itself. So stars which have uh, first ionization energies that are high uh, have usually uh, have non larger non-LTE effects than others. Um, so really sometimes we predict what could be the non-LTE effect of some elements that we haven't done calculations yet. But when we do the calculations, it reveals a whole set of really interesting uh, 
facts, especially that some lines are different than the others, even some lines that emerge from the same ground level to different higher energy levels can produce different effects. But usually, yes, for potassium, it can be large. It can be 0.6. I know that aluminum, and there are a few elements as well that have large non at effects, at least larger than the uncertainties themselves. Great, thanks, Johanna. Um, other questions? Andy? Hi, thanks for the talk, very good. Thank you. Um, so I just had one, you had that star, uh, your special star that you found the enhanced zinc in. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, so the other element that seems to be, seems to increase a great deal towards the more metal poor stars and is independent of the, the non-LT effect because it just makes it worse is cobalt and I was wondering if you had any comments on your the jet model and cobalt or and where you might think that that how you might explain the cobalt or, or well that's all thank you yes so actually that's a good question so cobalt um, is also one of the iron peak elements that are expected to get enhanced with a jet like supernova explosion including uh, I think nickel chromium as well however cobalt is sometimes difficult to to determine and so I think in this star we only had an upper limit of cobalt so we didn't actually have a measurement uh, so but in in the models or in the papers that preceded our our work uh, that uh, that included uh, what would you know what kind of elements would be enhanced using particularly jet like uh, high energy supernova as compared to the faint ones cobalt was one of the elements that that would get also enhanced along with zinc because it's also formed at this late stage of the supernova explosion itself uh, i was confused because i looked at the plot and the model seemed to show no significant cobalt enhancement in in that in that um figure anyway um so you mean between the, the supernova, the two different supernova explosions? Yeah, I thought you had a model, the jet model uh, imposed upon the abundances. And so I will share briefly to just show you this. So you're talking about this, right? Can you see my screen? So it's between, uh, so this is the cobalt here. And what we had is an upper limit only. So we didn't actually have a measurement. And yes, it did, it did increase slightly between uh, the different jet models. Uh, but, but remember that this is a log, uh, log scale. So this is about a 0 0.5 increase. So it's, it's quite an increase as well. And we can see that for copper as well and for zinc. So all of these usually are more enhanced. Um, even actually uh, titanium, uh, which, which is one of the elements that is expected to increase because of the jet and, and, and its, its ejecta from the center of the, of the star itself. I guess when I was squinting at it, it looked closer to solar than plus a half. And then in the observations anyway, it, it goes to plus a half without non-LT correction and the non-LT correction would make it even bigger. But so it's just fuzzy. That's what it is. It's just fuzzy. I think it is. We, we are really trying hard to improve upon these, these, uh, uh, these measurements and I think there has been other studies that are made for uh, less metal poor stars so or so that those stars are like that are extremely metal poor are minus three where there has been some uh, better cobalt and and more constraint on the iron elements region and I think they show that again uh, yes it's not as high or as highly enhanced as zinc but it's definitely larger than the solar value with with the spherical explosion Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, any other questions for Rana? Uh, I have a question then, um, which is maybe, um, so there's lots of groups that have been doing these non-LTE calculations and I'm wondering um, if you can say something about sort of comparisons and differences between those? Um, yes, so as you can imagine, these types of calculations depend highly on the atomic data. And uh, while we all try to use, you know, more or less similar uh, atomic data or the latest or the most up-to-date atomic data, you know, any differences can make uh, 
flight effects on the on the abundances themselves and also the machinery so the different codes used in the radiative transfer just like different lte codes lead to different abundances but i think overall uh, the nice thing which is good i'm happy that we all agree in terms of for example either positive or negative erect, uh, corrections for the certain lines uh, also uh, you know um, what is the general magnitudes of the correction so we all agree for example for iron that uh, the typical corrections for a model four star at minus two should be around 0 0.15 to 0 0.2 dex and obviously the more we add so you know atomic data as as you know, as it starts showing up more, people are paying attention to the atomic data that need to be calculated for these atoms. We try to plug them into our model atoms and try to improve upon the precision of the abundances. But I think we all agree that um, the, in terms of our results, that the, the corrections are more or less uh, of a similar scale. Um, there are atomic data that matter more than others. So I didn't talk about this, but during my PhD, I worked on the hydrogen collisions, particularly, and the rates of hydrogen collisions in stars and how much they affect. And turned out they, they affect uh, the abundances quite a lot uh, because they are the dominant features or the dominant collisions in atmospheres. And so for the longest time, people have been using classical theory, um, recipes in, in these, for these collisions. And when we started including quantum mechanically uh, calculated atomic data, we found that it made about like 0 0.2 dex difference in, in our abundances. But um, I think we're all agree that we need, you know, we need to include this, this highly useful uh, or the most up-to-date atomic data. Great, thanks. Okay, any last questions? Okay, then in that case, let's thank Rana um, again so much for uh, her time with us today. And so uh, yeah, so class. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. I'm so happy to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you.